Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. As many of you know, the Future of Freedom Foundation has been in existence some 27 years. Our mission is to present an uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy. And as part of that, we have long taken a fervent uh, opposition to the federal governments and to really all governments' war on drugs. As part of that, we've put together a series in which different people present their views as to why they believe the war on drugs is a bad government program and why it should be ended. I have uh, the pleasure today of welcoming David D'Amato, who's been a longtime libertarian. He's written many, many articles for the Future of Freedom Foundation, as well as many other publications. It's a big honor to have him here. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me, Jacob. It's great to be on. Yeah, it's nice to have your perspectives. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all? Sure. Uh, I live in Chicago. Uh, I'm an attorney. Um, I teach legal writing at DePaul, uh, and I, I write for Future Freedom Foundation, the Cato Institute's project, libertarianism.org, uh, you know, ho a host of other libertarian outlets, uh, Foundation for Economic Education, um, all over the place. Yeah, it's, uh, well, what's great about your writing is uh, you, you're able to communicate at a level where people can understand you, and your articles are always very well reasoned, very well thought out, and it's really nice to have you part of the writers uh, that are writing for Future Freedom Foundation. Okay, let's start out with the war on drugs. Give me your principal argument as to why you believe the war on drugs is, uh, is a bad program and why it should be ended. Sure. So there's, you know, so many, uh, I guess, interconnected reasons why the war on drugs is a bad idea. Um, but sort of from the outset, an important point to make uh, to non-libertarians or people who are sort of new to our arguments against the war on drugs is uh, our opposition to the war on drugs in principle um, doesn't have anything to do with uh, necessarily our attitudes about um, drug use itself. So, we, we see that question as properly within the realm of personal choice. And our arguments against drug prohibition are about, you know, even assuming we think as a society that drugs are harmful or uh, should be curtailed in some way, we think that the, the, the war on drugs is a bad idea even on those grounds. Um, it, it costs uh, billions of dollars and it ruins lives. It tears families apart, uh, you know, at, the, this familiar statistic now that people hear about how the United States has about 5% of the world's population, but about a quarter of its prison population. Um, when you think about it in those terms, those human terms, um, beyond just kind of the dollars and cents of it, uh, the, the war on drugs has just been extremely harmful to the social fabric here in the United States. Yeah, you raise an interesting point about the the perception that drugs are extremely harmful, and that really is an accurate perception. I mean, there's so many regular people in life, people who have children, uh, people who just have never heard the arguments for drug legalization that have grown up with the drug war, uh, that there's this perception that drugs really are dangerous, really are harmful, and in an objective sense, I mean, they can be. I mean, crack, cocaine, and so forth, there's certainly medicinal uses for, for drugs, but suppose somebody were to come up to you that, that's got a family that's concerned about drug abuse in American society and saying, look, drugs are bad. What? Why shouldn't we just make them illegal or keep them illegal? What do you say to them? Right. Right. So, yeah, on its face, it sounds, you know, sort of very reasonable. But one of the problems with it is uh, the, the war on drugs is actually not really helping us stop people from using drugs. People are going to use drugs, uh, you know, notwithstanding any of these policies. And what we're really doing with the war on drugs is, uh, you know, sort of a war on human beings. Um, as I mentioned, we've got more uh, more people in prison than anywhere else. Uh we also are disproportionately harming, you know, certain racial and ethnic minority communities. Uh, it's been the war on drugs has been compared to the new Jim Crow uh, for that for that reason. So what we're doing is, you know, imprisoning huge portions of the population who haven't done anything violent. Uh, maybe they only 
just possessed drugs or sold, uh, you know, a relatively harmless drug like marijuana to another uh, person, and and now they're going to be in prison for, you know, a large portion of their life. Uh, so we just see the war on drugs as uh, really destroying destroying human and lives and destroying families, tearing families apart, and not actually addressing. Yeah, it is sort of ironic. That example, which may, probably many of us who oppose the war on drugs do think that. Yeah, it is kind of ironic that people are presumably ruining their lives with drugs, so the government feels they need to ruin their lives even more by putting them in jail for 20 or 30 years. Right. Uh, now you mentioned yeah, that, exactly. That's the great irony of it. Yeah, you mentioned about the uh, the racist aspects of this. The, the new Jim Crow, as Michelle Alexander, the African American professor, has termed it in her great book uh, of that title. Would you delve a little bit into that and mm -hmm. tell us exactly what you mean by that? Sure. So uh, what we know is that across sort of racial and ethnic lines, uh, people use, sell, and possess drugs at relatively uh, comparable rates. So, you know, white people, black people, Hispanic people, we all sort of use and sell uh, and possess drugs at, at, rel at relatively the same rate. But what we see is that you know, those minority communities, in particular black communities, are targeted with this kind of uh, burgeoning police state that we've seen kind of rise up for the past several decades with, um, you know, use of SWAT teams uh, across the country and kind of paramilitary tactics um, and paramilitary paramilitary gear to target these communities. So it's almost as if these, uh, these minority communities, poorer sections of cities uh, have been, uh, in a way, occupied by the, you know, these military forces, and, and, and they seem like foreign military forces because the people that police these communities are not the people that live there. They don't understand the communities. Um, so we just have this kind of cycle of violence where drug prohibition is causing you know, gang violence, and then the police are uh, kind of in this ever escalating, you know, use of military tactics to target these communities, and um, and so it's it's just this you know terrible cycle of, of violence and imprisonment, and it's not actually going to the underlying problem. Yeah, I can understand how uh, African Americans in the inner city, especially those with children, would on the surface of things say, yeah, drugs are horrible, they're decimating our communities, and so we need to make them illegal. But after 30 or 40 years of this thing, you would think that African Americans would be leading the charge to legalize drugs. In a sense, as you pointed out, it has been a total failure, and it has fallen disproportionately on African Americans. Uh, you, you mentioned about the police state aspects of this, of this whole war. Delve into that a little bit. Sure. I, you know, I think one of the most kind of uh, underappreciated, perhaps, aspects of, uh, you know, the harms associated with the war on drugs is really just this idea that now for several decades it's served as the pretext that's been needed uh, to, to ramp up the, the police state. So the idea is that, you know, now with the war on drugs, it's always something that you can point that, you know, People who want to kind of ramp up the police state and curtail uh, civil liberties can always point point to that as kind of a justification. At least on its face, it, it seems to be a justification of a lot of these um, of a lot of these tactics. And even in the courts, um, you know, the the courts have been all too willing to kind of acquiesce to the the law enforcement communities. Uh, trampling um, on, on civil liberties, on constitutional rights, and, and then it could always point to this pretext. And uh, so I think that's kind of been something that, you know, related to, uh, related to other aspects of what's going on in the world, the war on drugs kind of feeds into this police state in that way. Yeah, you're a, a lawyer, of course, and, and so talk a little bit about what goes on in the law profession in this area. I mean, I, I've seen, I was a lawyer too, I practiced law for some 12 years, and I, I saw criminal defense lawyers making a killing. I was one of them uh, on drug cases, and 
And this thing's just been going on for so long. Uh, talk a little bit about the legal profession and, and what's going on there with, with drug drug prohibition. Sure. I, I think, you know, in the, in the criminal defense bar, I actually think most attorneys are quite good on, on these issues because they do really understand that they've seen up close the impact that it has on, on, the, uh, on the communities that they tend to, to serve. Um, but I think in the rest of the bar, people want very much to see themselves as sort of moderate and reasonable, and they don't want to take a hard line view on, you know, op- opposing, um, opposing drug prohibition because, you know, I don't think people un- uh, understand the empirics of it. They don't understand the argument, and so they're just afraid to take a, a position like that. But I do think that the criminal defense bar is very good uh, in general on, you know, these kinds of civil liberties issues and um, and hopefully helping, you know, to end the, the war on drugs. Yeah, of course, the irony is that they would be, all be put out of business if drugs were legalized, at least insofar as drug cases were concerned, uh, which would be a good thing. Right, I mean, they could right. devote themselves to more constructive uses. Uh, um, but the fact that they are representing people in this horrific government program certainly yeah. is something good. Talk a little bit about the constitutional aspects of this Fourth Amendment search and seizure and what the war on drugs has done to that aspect of our lives and to the to the constitutional order. Sure. So, you know, I, I talked a little bit about how I think the, the war on drugs has kind of given um, the law enforcement uh, community and prosecutors this kind of thing that they can point to on its face justifying all, all sorts of um, infringements. And unfortunately, I think the courts over the past, you know, uh, several decades have been all too willing to kind of go along with that. Um, the, and often the Supreme Court's been willing to kind of chip away at the uh, Fourth Amendment uh, as well. So, you know, certainly there have been certain cases uh, that have them the other way and, and seem to protect, you know, the rights of the criminal defendant and um, people's right not to be, you know, arbitrarily searched. Um, but, you know, we see things like no-knock raids and, uh, you know, as we both know as lawyers, the, the bar for getting a warrant is extremely low. So you have a situation where, you know, police officers are, are pretty much always able to get a warrant and, uh, and, and kind of just bust into people's homes um, very violently. You know, we hear about people getting shot in, in these, like, no-knock raids, people's dogs getting shot. Um, so th- this is kind of just out-of-control violence. So for people who value, you know, we as libertarians, we value law and order in a society where people are equal before the law. This is the kind of lawlessness and arbitrary, arbitrary force that really chips away at the underlying foundations of a, a free and, you know, prosperous society. You can't, you can't have a, a peaceful society while police are kind of empowered in this way, completely lawless, arbitrary way to, to, do, to do this to citizens. Yeah, it really is a shocking notion to us libertarians that a person can be sitting in the privacy of his own home all alone, uh, smoking pot or snorting cocaine or injecting heroin or doing right. whatever he wants to himself, and that somehow or another the government's got the authority to bash in his door, uh, shoot his pets, uh, violently arrest him. If he resists arrest, they kill him, and then they put him in jail for 20 or 30 years. It's really a shocking notion. Right. Uh, explain to me how no-knock raids work. Uh, what exactly is entailed there? Is it, How are the cops do that and how they get permission to do it and so forth. So, you know, the police officers in that situation will pre- will present, uh, you know, a modicum of evidence to, um, you know, uh, a, a member, of, member of the judiciary, and they'll sort of explain that uh, if we don't kind of do it in this way quickly, then evidence can be destroyed and, and things like that. They have all sorts of justifications or, you know, to me, again, I'd characterize these things as pretexts at this point because that's what I think they are. I think they're just pretextual reasons for uh, for officers to kind of exercise this arbitrary power. And then, you know, once they sort of have that permission, which uh, we know now is very, very easy for them to get, then they, they, they have a free hand, essentially, a blank check to, to violate people's rights with impunity. Um, 
and, and you know, as, as libertarians, we care a lot about sort of these warrant requirements and what you should have to do to, to get to, um, you know, these different, these different legal standards as far as reasonable suspicion and things like that. Uh, but we've seen that these are really just the, – the bars are so low now that uh, the police pretty much have a blank check to, to violate people's rights. And, you know, the, the on-the-street analogy to the no-knock raid is sort of the stop and frisk where uh, at any given time, um, based on nothing but the police officer's hunch, should just be stopped and uh, patted down and and most likely arrested because there always seems to be a reason to uh, take to take somebody into custody. Yeah, that that stop and and search uh, power really gives to me the bigoted cop the perfect opportunity to target blacks and Hispanics. I mean that that he gets praised because he's he's enforcing the war on drugs while. It's really just an excuse to humiliate blacks and demean them, and in many instances, and that all of that would disappear with drug legalization. The cops would no longer have that authority. Or a lot of the a lot of the automobile stops work the same way, don't they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I really do think that it. it mo- I think. Mo- most people enter the, the law enforcement profession to do the right thing, but I think there's been an element of, you know, groupthink in the in the profession now where police officers get in, you know, get into uh, these, you know, dangerous neighborhoods. And, again, it's a vicious cycle because they're dangerous because of drug prohibition. Um, but, but then they kind of get into the, you know, the neighborhoods and they develop this idea of, uh, the police and the people in in antagon in, in permanent antagonism, um, and so then they really do just want to humiliate people. But I think uh, they start off probably most of these are decent people who start off with the right uh, their heart in the right place. But it's just the incentives that are set up by this situation are all wrong. Um, and uh, you know we could we could end up having much more peace in, in these communities without without these policies. And we could dedicate all those resources to actually potentially helping people who uh, who who may need to try to find a way to get off drugs. Yeah, I really think it'd be that drug legalization would be the biggest benefit that could ever happen to cops. I mean, a lot of them would still be alive. Uh, they, a lot of them die in, in the line of enforcing drug laws, and, and certainly most cops want to do the right thing. I, I think there's a few that, that, that are bigoted, and they use the drug war as the excuse to exercise their bigotry. But it would be a really benefit, a big benefit for them if they no longer had to enforce these laws, and they were focusing only on murder and rape and stealing and violent crimes. Uh, what about the corruption aspect of this? Uh, talk a little bit about asset forfeiture and just the overall corruption that the drug war has brought to American society and to really to all society, especially in Latin America. Sure. So, you know, I talked a little bit about some of the incentive problems with, a, with the war on drugs and some of these kind of, uh, you know, moral hazards that it sets up. So civil asset forfeiture is this idea that, you know, Anything that you, anything that police officers or law, enfor- law enforcement generally have uh, acquired, sort of in investigating potential crimes, um, they they can they can just keep. Uh, so, and we've seen so many stories over the past few years about how this has kind of gone crazy, and the things that uh, police departments, municipal departments, are able to just take from people um, with impunity. Uh, so, you know, obviously, as libertarians, we want people to be secure in their, you know, in their lives and their liberty and their property. And this is just a this is just another way for uh, the state to kind of intervene in people's lives and, and essentially steal from them without any accountability to us as, you know, the citizens. Yeah, there's some real horror stories of where they just stop poor people who deal in cash for whatever reason have nothing to do with the war on drugs or drug drug dealing, and they just take their money, and they say, if you don't like it, sue us. And, of course, they can't sue because they don't have any money. It's been taken from them. Uh, so it's, it really is right. a cor- corrupting aspect. Have you been keeping up with what's been going on in the Philippines with President Duterte's war on drugs? No, I mean, 
I know that uh, I know that they kind of follow our our line on that, but I don't know too much about Philippines or their you know, their current domestic situation. Yeah, this guy's been out there shooting people on site. He says he's going to finally win the war on drugs, and so they've been killing people on site. They've killed some 2,000 people without taking them to trial, no due process, no anything, just just uh, really assassination. It's quite a fascinating uh, paradigm, and but it's with the objective that he's going to win the war on drugs, which, which raises the issue. Is is the war on drugs winnable from their perspective? You know, I don't really know how they would define winning, but let's uh, whether it's a drug-free society or drastically reduced drug use in society. But what do you think it would take for these people to find the drug warriors to finally say, "Well, we won the war on drugs. We can finally end this war, this this government program." You know, it's a good question. I mean, it's very hard for me to get into uh, to get into their heads on that. I think, you know, for, on an empirical basis, uh, as I said, if we're really just, you know, say we're just completely practical, utilitarian, forget libertarian theory in the abstract, uh, you know, even on those just purely empirical means and grounds, uh, the means that they've chosen here are completely mismatched to the ends. I mean, you, you haven't seen, you know, meaningful decline in, in actual drug consumption and use, uh, and you have, you know, extraordinary levels of violence in urban communities where uh, where the drug war is uh, sort of the front lines of the, of the war on drugs. So uh, just on a purely kind of data-driven basis. There's no, there's nothing I could, I, I can't imagine a more ridiculous uh, policy, a policy more ill-fitted to its own, the, the ends that it, that it's kind of put out there as its objectives. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I mean, 30 or 40 years ago, you could, you could understand somebody supporting the war on drugs because it was something relatively new. And they thought, well, yeah, this this might be a way that we can clean up drug use in society. But after 40 years, you would think people would say, well, okay, this didn't work out. Time to end it. Uh, but and and I think things are clearly moving in that direction. Uh, you've got these these states that have legalized at least marijuana, and other states that have it on the ballot in November. Uh, so it looks to me like. There is a clear shift in public opinion taking place in in this area. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think hopefully we are kind of reaching that critical mass of people uh, throughout the country that you need to get um, to get a, a genuine shift in, in public policy. And this just shows that uh, to get a change like that, it really does start with, with ideas um, ideas that people have just on the ground level. Um, because now, again, people are just reasonable people who don't have a particular axe to grind uh, ideologically are finally just seeing that, you know, okay, we have these proposed objectives that have been put forward for a long time now uh, with drug prohibition, and they're just simply not being accomplished. Uh, so now I think the only people trying to hold that back are kind of vested interests where um, – of course, you know, municipal police departments have um, have benefited tremendously because they can get all this kind of uh, – they, they get huge budget increases and they get military uh, hand-me-downs and things like that. But I think normal uh, normal people now are kind of finally seeing that even if we want, you know, to reduce the harm of drugs in society, this is just not doing that or anything close to that. Yeah, that's a good point you make about the vested interest and also the drug gangs and the drug cartels. Uh, they have a vested interest in continuing the war on drugs because they'd be out of business with, immediately with drug legalization. Uh, they couldn't compete right. in, a, in a legalized market. Yeah, you, right, you, right, exactly. I mean, in, go ahead. Well, you know, I, I've heard different numbers, even even – Obviously, we libertarians would like to see people's uh, taxes reduced, but I've seen even uh, people on the other side, kind of more progressive people, arguing about um, how much tax revenue you could you could increase. Uh, I've seen numbers like you know fifty billion dollars and things like that. 
uh, thrown around about how much money you could, uh, how much tax revenue you could raise by taxing, regulating um, the drug market. Uh, you know, obviously, I, I'd like to see it um, completely unregulated by anything other than competitive pressures, but that's sort of another argument that pe- people use to, to argue against the war on drugs. Yeah, and think of all the money that would be saved with respect to all the money that goes into the DEA and the courts and the bureaucracies. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. You raised a very interesting notion, though, that maybe we'll wrap it up uh, uh, with a discussion of this. You, you talked about the power of ideas, and that's that's really intriguing. I mean, it's really what has has driven us at the Future of Freedom Foundation for 27 years, and it's that notion – that ideas really matter. They can bring a shift in society, even if those in power are opposed to the shift. And we see that happening with with, uh, the drug uh, war. 27 years ago, I would be able to light up the phones on these radio talk shows just by calling for drug legalization because people are so outraged. Today, it's entirely different. I mean, there's op-eds, there's editorials, there's policemen, there's Federal judges are all calling for drug legalization. And so you and I do things like write articles and we we give speeches. And it's always with that conviction that things can shift as a result of the spread of those ideas, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, uh, you know, we we can never find genuine uh, social transformation until the ground is really prepared. um, and the ground is prepared by a change in the way people think about issues. You know, just as uh, in the in the 19th century, people people changed their ideas about uh, chattel slavery, uh, changing our ideas now, things like uh, the war on drugs, and and these kinds of things happen slowly over time. And the only that's the only way that they genuinely happen. Um, you can't sort of uh, have a violent revolution to replace a tyranny because a new one, you know, we think of the French Revolution and things like that, a new one will kind of spring up in its place. So the only way that you get genuine social change is kind of through this um, process of uh, the change will be toward one of respecting kind of the dignity and autonomy of each individual. Um, so that's, you know, that's the hope. Yeah, and you raise that, that, that concept of a critical mass. I mean, it doesn't really entail converting everybody. I mean, there's a lot of people that will never be converted to libertarian positions on the drug war or other issues. But, but you're talking about just finding enough people that reaches that critical mass that then brings the shift, despite the fact that not everybody has been brought over. Isn't that the case? Right. Yeah, exactly. I think on an issue-by-issue basis, a lot of people do have very libertarian ideas, even if they're uncomfortable with a particular label. So, you know, what the hope is is that kind of on these different issues uh, that that kind of raise up over the years, like recently, just in the past 10 years, we can see – uh, changes in people's attitudes about things like same-sex marriage and uh, and others. So we, you know, we we hope that people will kind of take it on an issue by issue basis and hopefully start to think in a in a in a more libertarian way, even if they don't want to apply uh, that, that label to it. They're just they're thinking more in terms of um, you know respect for individual choice, being free from kind of arbitrary aggression, uh, the right to exchange and trade freely with, with your neighbor or some kind of middleman arbitrarily intervening, things like that. Um, so hopefully that that will be the trend in a, in a whole host of issues. Yeah, and we see that trend especially in the drug war where you've got conservatives, liberals, libertarians, people that are non-ideologues all coming together to say time to end this war on drugs. Uh, David, this has been a great yep. discussion. I uh, greatly appreciate you coming on board to share your excellent perspectives on, on this issue. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. All right.